Thank you all for coming. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm a, a musician, and of course, like most musicians, I have a day job. Uh, my day job is that I run a laboratory, uh, a cognitive neuroscience laboratory, which is a fancy way of thinking that we study thinking. Uh, a fancy way of saying we study thinking. Uh, try to figure out what goes on in the brain when people are paying attention to things or not paying attention to them. And in particular, we're interested in the intersection between music and the brain. And um, a lot of people think, well, why would you want to mix science and art, science and music? They seem like two things that don't go together at all. As Stephen Jay Gould might have said, they're non-overlapping magisteria that should stay as far apart from one another as possible because they might contaminate one another. But I'm reminded of a quote by my colleague, uh, Robert Sapolsky, who says, uh, the arts, uh, are not meant to uh, ruin science. Uh, they're actually meant to reinvigorate and uh, allow us to re-experience science. Um, and science is meant to reinvigorate art. And I found this to be very true, that in my own work, every time I think that I'm on the verge of uncovering some new mystery, uh, in, in the laboratory, something about how music works. Five new ones pop up. It's like a game of whack-a-mole. I can never keep up. And in fact, um, as Sapolsky says, science isn't meant to, uh, uh, to demystify it. It's meant to reinvigorate it, and that's been my experience. And I wanted to share some of that with you. So if you had taken a class 20 years ago in psychology or neuroscience, you would have learned that music happens in the right side of the brain and language happens in the left. And we now no longer think that's true. It's a gross oversimplification. Instead, what's happening is a lot of subtle activity in both sides of the brain. In fact, uh, in my own laboratory where we do brain scans of people while they listen to music, we found that music activates every region of the brain that has so far been mapped. Music's on the right, on the left, in the front, in the back, on the top, and in the bottom. Uh, and we are now beginning to understand that more so than anything else, uh, music is a kind of food or fuel for the brain. I'll give you just one example. Uh, you, uh, over the last couple of years, if you've watched the Olympics, you've seen athletes with earbuds. What are they doing? They're listening to music. Why? I don't know that the athletes necessarily know the science behind this, but they've realized that it works. The neurons in your brain fire in synchrony to the tempo of the music that you're listening to. So if you're a runner and you can get um, music that's at a slightly faster pace than you would normally run, and then your neurons are firing at that pace, you can actually run faster. Same thing for weightlifters doing repetitions if they're trying to increase the repetition rate. Any athletic activity that involves some kind of timing, music, if it's carefully chosen, can actually uh, help you to perform better. Um, and because of the constant pulse of music, as you've probably seen, uh, if, you, if you try it for jogging or for exercycling, the constant pulse keeps you going, even when your willpower flags or you think you want to stop and um, take a break, the constant pulse gives you this kind of momentum in pushing you forward. Um, a little bit more about what's happening in the brain when we listen to music. Uh, there are a number of processes that go on, and it, it, it's not obvious, but let me use an analogy to vision. Um, when you look out across the room and you see different people and different objects and different colors, what you may not realize is that each of these attributes of things are processed in separate regions of the brain. So light comes in through your retina, it ends up being transmitted uh, to, you know, through neural transmission to the back of your brain, where your visual cortex is, and at that point, everything gets sent out to special processing circuits in the brain. So color is processed in one part of the brain, the shape of something in another, its spatial location in yet another. If the object is moving, that's in a separate area. And it all comes together later, so that if I'm holding up a red apple and a green apple, the, the color and the shape and the location get bound about 40 milliseconds after the light actually hits your retina. The same thing is true with music. 
As soon as the music passes through your eardrums, which are wiggling in and out in response to vibrations in the air, this sets off an electrochemical chain of events. Uh, and different processing units in the auditory cortex extract the pitch of the music versus the rhythm versus the timbre, that is the tonal color, the instrument that it is. Uh, and then after that, the loudness. And it all comes together later. But it happens so fast and so seamlessly that uh, you don't realize that it's been fractionated like that. Again, you know, 30 milliseconds, 30 thousandths of a second later, maybe, it all comes together. And the interesting thing here is that we've now seen uh, support for this, evidence for this, from a number of different converging sources. We've seen it in neuroimaging studies, uh, where we scan people's brains, but we've also seen it in patients. Uh, due to a stroke or a lesion or some sort of uh, brain trauma, we've seen patients who lose the rhythm, but they have all the other parts of music, or they lose the pitch, but they still can process rhythm. Uh, I guess people who lose pitch and can still process rhythm are drummers. Uh, <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, this idea of the components, I think, is really fascinating, and uh, it underscores the complexity of music and really the miraculousness of how it does all come together and give us that great sense of joy. Um, there's another thing that's interesting uh, that's come out of the laboratory just in the last few years that I wanted to share with you, uh, and that has to do with music's health effects. Now, there have been a lot of stories about music as medicine, and for years, it was all just anecdote. And in science, it's important to remember that the plural of anecdote is not data. Anecdotes are just stories. Data comes from careful and systematic observations, following the scientific method, having control groups and such. And there were lots and lots of stories about the power of music, but not a lot of data. But fortunately, in the last five years, um, diligent researchers uh, have started collecting some of these data. And it's interesting what we've discovered. Uh, music does function as medicine in some contexts. Uh, for example, Listening to pleasurable music releases dopamine, the so-called feel-good hormone in the brain, and uh, can function in that sense almost like an antidepressant. If you're sad and you suffer either from clinical depression or you're just feeling regular old sad without any um, you know, clinical psychopathology, what do you do? Often people reach for sad music, and they find that it helps them to, to feel better. Now, you might be thinking, why would they do that? Why wouldn't somebody who was sad reach for happy music? And the reason is that when you're sad or depressed, you're usually feeling misunderstood, like the people around you don't understand you, and that's contributing to these feelings of sadness, is the sense of detachment. Uh, and so if somebody comes along and says, oh, well, you ought to listen to some happy music, uh, you just feel even less understood. You want to you know, kick them in the face. So, um, if you put on the right piece of sad music, you go, oh, that's how I feel. This person understands me. This musician gets it. They've been through it, and they're expressing it so beautifully. They not only had this terrible experience where they felt they were at the bottom of a cliff, but they you know, somehow managed to get out of it and come through it and turn it into this beautiful work of art. So the sad music uh, turns out to be soothing, unlike the happy music when you're feeling sad. And we now know that listening to sad music uh, releases prolactin. This is the same chemical that's released when mothers nurse their babies. It's a soothing hormone that makes you feel comforted. Another thing that music does is it increases the production of immunoglobulin A. IgA, as you may know, is responsible for mucosal immunity for uh, disorders of the mucus system, colds, uh, flus, and things like that. And listening to pleasurable music boosts the production of IgA. It also uh, helps to boost the production of NK, that is natural killer cells, T cells to help boost the immune system overall. Uh, and it reduces cortisol levels. Cortisol is the stress hormone, uh, and it's toxic. Uh, and you don't want to have too much of it in your bloodstream. It leads to fatigue and cloudy thinking. Uh, now, the interesting thing here, people always ask me, um, what music should I listen to? And the interesting part of it is, you probably already know. 
Uh, as music therapy evolves as a field, I don't think you're going to go to a doctor, a music doctor, and have them say, oh, depression, uh, take two Joni Mitchells and call me in the morning. Uh, <laughs> Everybody knows already what music does for them, most of us anyway, certainly if you're here in this talk tonight. Um, we have an exquisitely sensitive notion of how the music in our lives makes us feel. And the majority of people use music every day for mu mood regulation. We listen to a certain kind of music in the morning to help us get going, a different kind of music at night to unwind. There's a kind of music you use to get through your exercise workout. And in effect, we're using, them like, we're using the music like we use drugs. We, you know, we use caffeine to get up in the morning, alcohol to calm down after a fight with somebody, or with enough alcohol to get into a fight with somebody. Uh, but uh, the idea is that music is regulating the hormones and the neurotransmitters effectively the way that drugs do. So the answer to music therapy is for doctors uh, and uh, patients, or, or just any of us on our own, to recognize that music has this power over us, this influence on us, and to use it, uh, to, to be systematic about it, create a playlist that will help you do whatever activity it is that you're doing. Um, the other thing that uh, is interesting is that the, um, the playlists really, um, in general, uh, work better when you're the one selecting the music. There was a study that just came out a couple of years ago where people in a pre-operative setting in a hospital, in an experiment, were either given Valium, which is what you normally give them, a benzodiazepine to calm them down before surgery, or they were given music. And either they were given music that the doctor gave them or music that they could choose themselves. And the people who could choose their own music showed much less anxiety than the people who had Valium or the people who had the music forced on them. And, and you know, the great thing about music is, in this context is that it's organic, it doesn't have any side effects, uh, and, and it's relatively cheap, uh, practically free. Um, I wanted to close with just uh, another topic that uh, I cover in the book, This Is Your Brain on Music that I've become fascinated by over the last uh, decade. I began my career as a recording engineer and a record producer, and I, I was always fascinated by the idea that some musicians really are better than others. And what is it that makes for a great musician? And, and how, do, how is it that they become that? The Yo-Yo Ma's, the Paul McCartney's of the world, where do they get it from? Is, musical talent innate? Is it genetic? Uh, or is it just a lot of hard work? And the emerging picture from the study of expertise, not just studying musical experts, but expertise in a variety of domains, including chess players and athletes and writers uh, and scientists, is that it's mostly a lot of hard work and it's not genetic. Uh, and one of the strongest pieces of evidence for this in music comes from an experiment that was done in England where students who entered a conservatory were judged the day they arrived. Uh, a panel of four musicians listened to them play and rated them. Now, let's consider two opposing accounts of how it is that people become great musicians. Either you're just born with it, in which case it's talent, or you work really, really hard, in which case it's hard work. So the students enter the conservatory, they're rated on a scale of 1 to 100 for how good they are, and then they're each given a diary, and they're told to write down in the diary every time they practice, how long they practice, what they practice, and so on. And at the end of the four years, when they graduate from the conservatory, another group of judges rates them again on a scale of 1 to 100. Now, if the talent account is true, if it's all innate, if you're just born that way, then the students who scored at the very highest when they arrived, should still be the highest when they leave the conservatory because it's just innate. On the other hand, if what predicts performance in music is the amount of time you put in the diary studies, the, the, you know, the, the diary entries should predict who was the most highly rated when they left. And overwhelmingly, it was, it was merely the amount of time they put in. The students who began at the beginning of their studies at the top only stayed at the top if they were the ones who were putting in the most time. Whatever rating you got when you arrived at the conservatory 
was, uh, had zero predictive validity. It, could, it told us nothing about who was going to be at the top when they left. It was all about the hours they put in. And in my career as a producer, I had the unusual and marvelous opportunity to meet many top musicians and ask them, where do you think talent comes from? Did it, were you just born this way, or did you work really hard? And every single person I asked said that they didn't think it was inborn, they thought it was hard work. And the most surprising account came from Stevie Wonder. I mean, if there was ever a musician in our lifetime who you would think was just born with it, it would be Stevie Wonder. He's incredible. Uh, he's a multi-instrumentalist, he's a great writer, he's a gifted vocalist. But Stevie said that he remembered the thousands of hours that he spent struggling, practicing, not happy with the results, trying to go over and over and over it again. Uh, and he estimated that he put in 10,000 hours before he was happy with where he was. Uh, and this is the story that emerges over and over again. You've probably heard of the 10,000 hour rule, that to become a world-class expert in anything takes 10,000 hours of practice. If you work it out, that's uh, 20 hours a week for 10 years. Now, I want to be clear, it doesn't mean that if you put in the 10,000 hours, you're guaranteed to become an expert. <laughs> but if you don't put in the 10,000 hours, it's almost certain that you won't be. In fact, there aren't any counterexamples. Nobody's ever come up with somebody who spent uh, less time than 10,000 hours to become a world-class expert. And people always say, oh, well, what about Mozart? He was writing symphonies when he was four, uh, and you know, he hadn't even lived 10,000 hours then. But in fact, uh, a very clever study was done that looked at Mozart's output. The, well, you look at Mozart's output across his lifespan, and you look, you follow a, a simple assumption. The assumption is that the pieces of Mozart that are deemed better will be performed more often and recorded more often. And so somebody simply went, uh, his name is John Hayes, a cognitive scientist, simply went and looked at the, t uh, the recordings made uh, of Mozart pieces, and it turns out that the pieces Mozart wrote before about the age of 14 are performed very seldomly and they're recorded very seldomly. They're typically only included in a, in a complete Mozart retrospective. It was around the age of 14 that his work reached the point where people today still want to record it and perform it and pay to hear it. So 14, he started at four, 10 years. Easily 10,000 hours, even for Mozart. Now, I find this notion inspiring. What it tells me is that any of us, if we're willing to put in the work, can get there. I find it a great democratizing and a, and a great, greatly encouraging notion that if we can just put in the work, we can do almost anything we want. Now, if you're five feet tall, you're not going to become an NBA player, and if you're seven feet tall, you're not going to become a jockey. There are physical limitations. But I think the idea is that for, for the arts, uh, if we're willing to put in the work, any of us can do it. And as listeners, if we're willing to put in the work, uh, making playlists and selecting our music, we can really reap the benefits of, of music in our, our spiritual life, our psychological life, and our physical life. Thank you very much. Thank you.